Well, how old were you when you started writing English? Funny thing is, well, that's how I started was that uh, that because I started cavalry riding, but um, I don't know where or why, but as I was continuing on through college without uh, only one exposure to a horse, and that was at the park where I lifeguarded in the summer, I just developed again to ride, and then when I got to Des Moines and was uh, the job on the radio there, one of the fellows at the radio station was a reserve officer in the cavalry. And the 14th Cavalry was stationed there at, uh, at Fort Dumont. <coughs> and under the Defense Act then, you could enlist as a candidate for commission. So in reality, you had enlisted in the Army, but you don't actively go there. And then they had a correspondence set up for lessons. They had a weekly class. Uh, and then also, weekly, you went out there to the post and were trained in cavalry training and riding, shooting and everything else. And uh, at the same time, you could also then get out there in between times if you had the time and, and ride and over the cavalry reservation where they had jumps and courts and all that. And then I got my commission there as a reserve officer and from then on I was, I was stuck riding, but I didn't get around to owning a horse until I bought the one that I rode in the picture stallion road. You actually bought the horse that the studio had given you to ride? <clears throat> they hadn't given it to me. I had found it there. It belonged to a fellow that had horses. And uh, he's the one who later became my first partner in a ranch. Uh, he met an officer in the At Royal Italian Cavalry, and they were really, they were leaders in the world in, in riding. They were the, beginners of the forward seat and so forth. And uh, I persuaded the studio to to uh, hire that horse for the part in the picture. I'd been riding it by the time the picture was over I, I bought it. That's <laughs> great. And she provided me with 37 years of riding. 37 years? Yeah. Her and then first her daughter. Oh, okay. I was going to say, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. And then her daughter died of an illness, and then it was little man that I had up at the ranch, that horse. And then he came to the end of the line just through age, and I added it all up. And her and her daughter and her son had uh, been my riding for 37 years. That's great. <coughs> well, you just did your interview for Western Horsemen. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote and sent, sent their magazine in and uh, were interested in uh, some history on your riding career. <laughs> so it's funny that we started talking about it because I'll yeah. write him back and tell him just what you said. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes. Oh. We do have some business to conduct here. Ten seconds, mic's on. Stand by. My fellow Americans, today we celebrate Flag Day, the birthday of our stars and stripes. As we think back over the history of our nation's flag, we remember that the story of its early years was often one of hardship and trials, sometimes a fight for simple survival. Such is the story behind our star-spangled banner. It was two years into the War of 1812 when America seemed to be teetering on the edge of defeat. The British had already taken our capital and burned the White House. Baltimore was the next target in a grand design to divide our forces and crush this newly independent nation of upstart colonies. All that stood between the British and Baltimore were the guns of Fort McHenry, blocking their entry into Baltimore Harbor. The British bombardment lasted for 25 hours. Through the dark hours of the night, the rockets fired and the bombs exploded and a young American patriot named Key, held captive aboard a British ship, watched anxiously for some proof, some sign, that liberty would prevail. You can imagine his joy when the next morning in the dawn's early light he looked out and saw the banner still flying, a little tattered and torn, but still flying proudly above the ramparts. Fort McHenry and the brave men manning it had withstood the assault, 
Baltimore was saved. The United States, this great experiment in human freedom, as George Washington described it, would endure. Thinking back to those times, one realizes that our democracy is so strong because it was forged in the fires of adversity. In those dark days of the war, it must have been easy to give in to despair. But our forefathers were motivated by a cause beyond themselves. From the harsh winter of Valley Forge to the blazing night above Fort McHenry, those patriot soldiers were sustained by the ideals of human freedom. Through the hardships and the setbacks, they kept their eyes on that ideal and purpose, just as through the smoke of battle, they kept a lookout for the flag. But with the birth of our nation, the cause of human freedom had become forever tied to that flag and its survival. As the American Republic grew and prospered and new stars were added to the flag, the ideal of freedom grew and prospered. From the rolling hills of Kentucky to the shores of California, to the sea of tranquility on the moon, our pioneers carried our flag before them, a symbol of the indomitable spirit of a free people. And let us never forget that in honoring our flag, we honor the American men and women who have courageously fought and died for it over the last 200 years. Patriots who set an ideal above any consideration of self. Our flag flies free today because of their sacrifice. And I hope you all will join Nancy and me and millions of other Americans at 7 o'clock this evening, Eastern Daylight Time, when we pause a few minutes to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Though separated by many miles, we will be together in our thoughts. These anniversaries remind us that the great American experiment in freedom and democracy has really just begun. They remind us of the terrible hardships our forefathers willingly endured for their beliefs, and they challenge us to match that greatness of spirit in our own time. And I know we will. We are, after all, the land of the free and the home of the brave. If we ask ourselves what has held our nation together, what has given it the strength to endure and the spirit to achieve, we find the answer in our families and those basic family values of work, hope, charity, faith, and love. So it's appropriate that this year Father's Day falls on the same weekend as Flag Day. Or in commemorating fatherhood, we're also expressing a basic truth about America. What does fatherhood mean today in America? I guess the same as it always has. Fatherhood can sometimes be walking the floor at midnight with a baby that can't sleep. More likely, fatherhood is repairing a bicycle wheel for the umpteenth time, knowing that it won't last the afternoon. Fatherhood is guiding a youth through the wilderness of adolescence toward adulthood. Fatherhood is holding tight when all seems to be falling apart, and is letting go when it is time to part. Fatherhood is long hours at the blast furnace or in the fields, behind the wheel or in front of a computer screen, working a 12-hour shift or doing a six-month tour of duty. It's giving one's all from the break of day to its end, on the job, in the house, but most of all, in the heart. Now, if you're thinking, look who's talking. Now, he's a father himself. Well, that's right. But on today, I think we could all remember, this weekend at least, that every father is also a son. So on this day for fathers, we too say thanks to America's dads for the labor and legacy of our families and our freedoms. Until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. I put in that last disclaimer there myself because I thought they'd kind of written it up. Pretty much too much praise for a fellow who's already a father himself. Oh, <laughs> I see what you mean. I thought I'd better remind him. <laughs>